Do you want a holiday card from DTNS? Well, become a patron and give us your address by November 15th, and we'll send you a special DTNS holiday card. Coming up on DTNS, Meta might open a store so you can try out the Quest headset. Can teaching robots to love each other help us love ourselves? And Apple makes it harder to repair an iPhone screen. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday. Remember, remember the 5th of November, 2021 in Los Angeles, but still celebrating Guy Fox Day. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us, AVXL host Patrick Norton. How are you, Patrick? I'm I'm wearing my uh, my Eckert's <laughs> farm sweatshirt. I forgot to show you during the Ooh. joy that is good day internet. I've been to Eckert's so. many a time in my youth. <laughs> Look at that. Elvin Eckert, <laughs> Belleville, Illinois, not a paid sponsor. Uh, hey, we were just talking to Amos about uh, lots of cool things about Alaska, including the fact that there are no roads leading to its capital. If you'd like to understand why, Get Good Day Internet, available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Big thanks to our top patrons like Justin Zellers, Eric Holm, and Carmine Bailey. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Middle East Eye reports that streamers in Turkey have been uncovering a money laundering scheme that uses Twitch's bits. Twitch viewers can buy bits and use them to express appreciation for streamers, if you, you don't realize that. Uh, that contributes to the streamer's earnings. The Turkish streamers found references in that leaked Twitch payment information to Twitch accounts that were earning up to $1,800 a day, but only had 40 to 50 viewers. The scheme was to take stolen credit cards, buy the bits, strike deals with Twitch streamers where they would use the bits, and then those streamers would refund like 80% of that money to other accounts. A Twitch spokesperson told Middle East Eye, quote, we will not hesitate to take decisive action against accounts engaged in prohibited content. The street finds its own uses for things, to quote Mr. Mm -hmm. William Gibson. Oh, so true. So true. New York City's mayor-elect Eric Adams announced he will take the first his first three paychecks in Bitcoin. Adams tweeted Thursday that New York City is going to be the center of the cryptocurrency industry. This follows Miami Mayor Francis Suarez announcing Tuesday he would take his next paycheck in Bitcoin. Oh, we got a beef. Miami and New York City. <laughs> who's, who's the biggest Bitcoin user? Uh, DJI announced the $2,199 Mavic 3 drone. It includes a custom Hasselblad L2D 20C camera using a 4 3rd S sensor with a 24 millimeter prime lens and a 28X hybrid zoom telephoto lens able to shoot 4K at 120 frames per second. Offers 46 minutes of flight time and a video transmission range of 15 kilometers. There's also a $4,999 Mavic 3 Cine edition, like, you know, cinema, S-C-I-N-E. Uh, that includes a terabyte solid state drive and the ability to encode video as if you're Denis Villeneuve. No, it's uh, actually an Apple ProRes 422 HQ. It doesn't give you any actual talent. Uh, you have to bring that yourself. But ProRes is nice. Yeah, ProRes Microsoft. <laughs> It is nice. Oh, my goodness. Microsoft has fixed an expired certificate that was causing some features in Windows 11 to fail, including <laughs> the snipping tool, touch keyboard, and emoji panel. The certificate expired on October 31st. Microsoft issued an out-of-band update Friday to resolve the issues. I was, like, on the fence about putting this in the show yesterday because it broke right as we were doing the show. <laughs> and I'm, I, I thought, you know what? I'll wait and see if they fix it. And they did. And I'm happy. Good job. Microsoft. Well done. Alphabet announced a new company called Isomorphic Laboratories is being formed uh, to use artificial intelligence methods for drug discovery. Uh, so you, you put those machine learning on, on looking for new combinations uh, and maybe finding some that'll work. It'll build off the work of another Alphabet subsidiary, DeepMind, which uses AI to predict the structure of proteins. DeepMind CEO Demi Hassabis will serve as CEO of Isomorphic as well. All right, let's talk. Let's get physical, if I if I may quote <laughs> Olivia Newton John. Xiaomi is the latest tech company to expand its physical retail presence, announcing it will open twenty thousand shops across China Whoa. in smaller towns and cities. They already have shops open in like Beijing and a few places, uh, but they're going to open larger Xiaomi stores, and some may even be selling Xiaomi's electric vehicles. Also, the New York Times sources say that Meta has been examining the idea of opening its own shops since last year. 
The sources described the locations as possibly being demonstration spaces. If you've ever been to like a Sony or a Samsung experience store, something like kind of like that, uh, show off ideas being researched by Meta's reality labs. It could also show off current devices like the Quest VR headset, portal smart displays, Ray-Ban stories glasses. Uh, the documents that were seen by the New York Times indicate that the goal of the shop would be to provide a, quote, judgment-free journey while experimenting with the devices. First store would be, uh, if they do decide to do this, which they may not, but the first store would be in Burlingame, California, which is near Reality Labs offices. But Patrick, I know both of us have been to those experience stores where they like, you know, do let you run around and have fun and, and bond with the brand. Uh, seems like that's a no-brainer for a company that's got VR headsets and 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 wants to get more into building a metaverse, right? Yeah, and then eleventy-four billion dollars sitting around waiting for something to do. I, it's it's interesting because I, on one hand, the whole meta concept has made me be like VR is dead to me, practically almost, except for the gaming. And on another goal, it's also. I think they already know that a big problem they have with making Facebook. I mean, Meta. Uh, usable by everyone is so many people are like, uh, uh, I'm not putting that on my head. No. Are you ridiculous? That's ridiculous. I'm not putting that ridiculous thing on my head. And I think they just want to give people the opportunity to embrace the meta, you so know, lock that thing on the back of your skull and make sure that you work <laughs> for IO 24 seven. So your debt I, is paid. <laughs> I wanted to make fun of the judgment free journey quote, but when, now that you've explained that, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about that. I don't want to yeah. look stupid. It's like, here, try it on, look in the mirror. Uh, this obviously is banking on the idea that things like Ray-Ban stories become the norm, sure. where you're like, actually, that doesn't look bad. I may not like it for other reasons, but at least I, I don't feel embarrassed uh, to wear it. Uh, and 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 in that case, it's, it's like any kind of clothing store or eyeglasses sure. shop, right? It's like, hey, try it on, see what you think. It's it's a it's funny to watch because I've traveled in a bunch of places in the last year and a half where mall culture is actually fairly thriving, but you know I'm curious to see whether or not these pop up, what the experience is like, can they keep them running, you mm -hmm. know how often do you have to clean the nose piece on the headset? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to work in one of these, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> and obviously, if they're talking about starting it in Burlingame, that means it's an experiment. They just want to try yeah. out the idea. When, when they say they're going to open one in Tokyo or Seoul or New York City or London, then then we know they're getting serious. They're getting serious. Yeah. Uh, let's talk chips. One of the biggest differences between Apple's M1 chip and an Intel or AMD chip is you can't buy an M1 chip from Apple and build your own machine with it. But if you could, I think a lot of folks might. The chips are fairly <laughs> universally praised for their performance. Yeah. Uh, a lot of that is due to Apple's chip design team, and some of that is down to the M1s being built on TSMC's 5 nanometer process. That gives them a lot of advantages. The information has sources that gave them a peek at Apple's chip roadmap. Apple's not releasing this, but according to the information, here's what we've got to expect. In 2022, next year, expect Apple to generate a second generation of chips, perhaps to be called the M2, I guess. I don't know. Um, these would still be on the five nanometer process. They'd be an updated uh, or upgraded five nanometer process. So overall performance and efficiency gains would be there, but they, they wouldn't be drastic. They'd be small. Uh, but sources say that some of these second generation of chips might feature two dies, which would double performance in larger machines like desktops. In fact, the first second gen chip from Apple is expected to show up in a MacBook Air, but Bloomberg's Mark Gurman has previously reported his sources expect a two-die chip to show up in a Mac Pro. Uh, farther down the road in 2023, Apple would plan to use TSMC's forthcoming three nanometer process uh, and make chips to feature up to four dies and up to 40 cores. These third generation, dare I call them M3s, uh, reasonable. would be uh, reportedly codenamed Ibiza, Lobos, and Palma, which... Hmm. Have you've at least named one of your dogs that one of those code names? <laughs> Remember, you have an Ibiza or a Palma. Uh, also, the A series Lupin. chips for the for the iPhone uh, may move to three nanometer processes in 2023 as well. That's right. Your your code named Lupin, not code named Lobos. It was a, another friend of mine had had a uh, wolf hybrid uh, named Lobos. Anyway, uh, 
exciting news. I don't think any of this is shocking, but it's it's kind of kind of fun to hear what the roadmap is and see how many cores we might be heading to. Uh, obviously, three nanometers uh, well ahead, uh, yeah, you know, of of a lot of competitors. But anybody can use TSMC's foundries if they if they got the the right amount of money. Uh, I'm yeah. curious what you make of this, and I'm also curious what you're thinking of the Alder Lake an, uh, announcement from yesterday. It's uh, it's been really interesting to watch. I have a couple friends that literally bought these notebooks. Uh, in one case, they're doing video production. In the other case, they they crunch massive amounts of code and massive, massive chunks of database. And they have both been universally freaking out at the performance. Uh, and and then just kind of looking at their Intel machines and being like, I'm too embarrassed to give this to my spouse or my older children. I'll just give it to the dog or the cat to use now. And uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, but only slightly. Uh, the memory bandwidth on these is ridiculous. It's like enterprise processors for most other companies. Um, it's been really interesting to watch Intel with the Alder Lake release, you know, that, that they're sort of competitive again in a lot of ways in terms of... Uh, uh, multi threaded performance uh, compared to AMD. And uh, I, I think Intel's picking up speed again, but also Pat, uh, Pat Gelsinger has been talking a lot lately about how we're going to win back Apple's business. And I'm like, boy, you're going to have to move faster. Um, I'm really curious to see what that happens. I also would really like to see Apple reduce the price of uh, the memory and SSD upgrades. Uh, on the laptops or the desktops, I'm not even going to hold my breath for a microsecond waiting on that. But uh, these 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 would be more accessible to more people if they they weren't so. It's particularly huge the vig between sort of what these cost versus you know what the the same basic chips cost inside of of the Apple hardware. And uh, I haven't yeah. complained about that in a long time. But I remember being like, wow, that's a really spendy upgrade on storage that you can't upgrade any other way. The so. storage, particularly the 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 RAM, uh, they don't really give you a whole lot of options because they don't really need them right. the way they designed the chip. But the storage options are just like almost abusive once you get past <laughs> you know a couple of terabytes. Um, that well, said, M1, I'm on one right now and it's silent. I haven't heard a fan in this I, room from a I from a Mac. Have, I. I've put together a massive state-of-the-art AMD workstation, and I literally am tempted to go back to OS 10 for the first time since 2016. Um, it's so good. I'm just like, oh. Yeah. No. <laughs> we often focus on how humans and robots get along on this show, but what about how robots get along with other robots? MIT's CSAIL scientists are trying to teach robots how to interact with each other. The scientists created a simulated 2D environment in which virtual robots pursued social and physical goals. So a physical goal might be, you need to move from here to that virtual tree over there. Uh, another physical goal might be, you need to take some virtual water and water the virtual tree. A social goal would be, help another robot water the tree. The simulation had three kinds of robots. Uh, the first only had physical goals. The second had both kinds of goals, social and physical, but assumed that all the other robots only had physical goals. And then the third had both goals and assumed all the other robots had both goals. Uh, no matter what, it resulted in robots exhibiting behaviors recognizable as social by human observers in most <laughs> instances. So they had people look at this and say, do you think these robots are acting socially? And they, most instances, they said, yeah, they are. So the next step is to create more complex 3D environments for testing, and then obviously down the road, do this with actual robots out in the real world. And the project not only hopes to enable robots to work collaboratively with robots and humans, but also help encourage better social interaction among humans. If they can learn what causes good social interactions with the robots, we might be able to learn from that ourselves. In fact, Engadget quotes senior author Andre Barbu, quote, can we make an objective test for your ability to recognize social interactions? Maybe there is a way to teach people to recognize these social interactions and improve their abilities. I'm I'm laughing not because this is funny or an unnoble goal because but because I'm raising children. <laughs> and and so you would like this research to be done sooner? I, no, it's like obscenity. I may not be able to define it, but I know when I've seen it. So an objective sure, test, sure. I I'm sure it would be useful. Um 
everybody knows which kind of robot they're dealing with in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, all, all kidding aside, I, I think there's something here to be able to say, like, we might be able to improve how we identify social interactions uh, in a way that that is useful, in a way that that helps us yeah. understand. And man, especially if this could be applied to social networking and interactions on social networks. I mean, I I think that is a problem that everyone complains about and everyone pretends they know why uh, it happens, but nobody does. Uh, this study is not touching on that yet, but I, I'm sort of jumping two steps from the study. Uh, in the meantime, just having robots be more collaborative and, and be able to identify when you need help like a robot in the workplace that can run over and go, oh, let me let me let me pitch in on that uh, huge advance in in workplace. You look robots. emotionally distraught at that new deadline. Yeah, <laughs> let's help plan that, out a new course of action. You just dropped your groceries. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What do you want to hear us talk about on the show? You want more robot talk? Let us know. One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. iFixit confirmed that third-party display repairs on the iPhone 13 disable Face ID in almost every instance, unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, the old way of replacing screens is going to disable Face ID. That means that mall mm. repair shop is going to be slower if they offer it at all for replacing a screen on an iPhone 13. Uh, the problem is the iPhone pairs to its screen now in the 13 using a small microcontroller. And if you want to reactivate Face ID, you need to log the repair to Apple's servers and sync the serial numbers of the phone and the screen. That's a security measure, and it can be done by any shop that is either an Apple authorized service provider or part of Apple's new independent repair program, or AIRP. So it's more widely accessible than it would have been in the past, but a lot of repair shops don't like the terms of Apple's IRP. Uh, if you haven't heard about this, we haven't talked about it on the show before, but the IRP requires shops to agree to unannounced audits for up to five years after they stop being part of the program. <laughs> so you sign up, you're agreeing to at least five years from the moment you stop, if you ever stop. It also requires shops to share names, phone numbers, and home addresses of Apple repair customers, likely stuff that Apple might already have if you bought something from Apple, but a lot of shops are like, yeah, I'm not comfortable sharing my customer's info that way. Apple has not provided another way to pair a new screen, so if you're not gonna be part of IRP or an authorized service provider, then you gotta figure out a workaround. iFixit said the shops can physically move the chip from the original screen onto the replacement. That would keep it synced up with Face ID, but that requires micro-soldering, a sophisticated skill that takes a lot of practice to acquire. Uh, I imagine I might not even be able to acquire it at all, personally. Mm -hmm. This pairing requirement is new to the iPhone 13. Previous Face ID implementations in the 12 and before did not have this issue. So Apple did not consider this a requirement for Face ID to be secure until the iPhone 13. It's interesting to look at the article, uh, Kyle Weens, or no, this is uh, Kevin Purdy put this out over at iFixit. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the texts they said is like, look, three in 10 screen repair shops can do soldering, like one in three can deal with uh, the level of complexity in soldering this device. There's been some sounds and noises around this being an operating system update and it'll be fixed. Uh, at this point, the only operating system update they've seen is that uh, you know, it, the, uh, the phone now tells you it is unable to activate Face ID on this phone. I, I'm waiting to hear Apple give some like technical detail about why this is important for security moving forward on the platform. And part of me is also looking at this and being like, this seems like a nice way to just push more shops into being part of their program. And I also got to give a shout out the idea of, you know, it may not sound like much. Oh, you just have to keep phone numbers and contact information. But to do that, you know, for every customer and then to have to be responsible for holding on that information for five years under the threat of Apple's uh, crack legal team taking your life apart one billable hour at a time uh, for your lawyer at the receiving end is I can see where people would be less than interested in that. It's, it's frustrating. Uh, on, to look at on, like this. Just, just to give the other side of this, cause I see Nick with a C saying, ah, news, Apple's anti-consumer. Um, this is not <laughs> going to harm most consumers, right? Most consumers will go to an authorized service provider, if not Apple itself 
the, to, to get their phone fixed. A lot of consumers will want that. They'll choose that. They'll say, I don't want to go to an independent shop. So, so there's a defense of Apple to say, like, they are making repairs wider than ever. Uh, also, I tend to look at these things and think, yeah, the knee-jerk reaction is to assume they did it on purpose. Usually with Apple, they've done something because they had a reason and they didn't consider repairability. Right. To me, that's their sin. It's not that they actively try to stop you from repairing. It's that they do something because they think it's better. And they, if, if, if it makes it less repairable, they don't consider that a reason not to do it. They're like, well, so what? <laughs> that's your problem. Uh, and you could also argue that do the vast majority of people, you know, what percentage of iPhone owners actually break their screens? You know, right. Um, and, and if a minimal number or a tiny percentage do, then it's not that big a deal. Right. Eh. Right. right. Except to those, you know, I mean, I've figured out between, you know, tempered glass and, and, you know, armor, <laughs> I've managed to keep, uh, you know, my last two iPhones from shattering a screen and, or bending, uh, the bending part being particularly frustrating, but the, uh, you know, it's, it's always frustrating when things are more onerous. I mean, I've been having parallel. There's a the engineers at Chrysler who built the Dodge truck I drive, uh, you know, decided to take a lot of old school, simple circuit breakers and or fuses and to miniaturize them and make them computer controlled in a way that is accessible only by someone with a dealer level software system which wasn't too bad around 2006, 2007, when my truck was built, when they figured out that there was a problem with these. Um, but now you can't even find the knowledge locally at the dealers. You know what I mean? I have to go in with a stack of information because, you know, there was a short, you know, I had to basically, it's just, there's a lot of unintended consequences. I, I hear what you're saying, Tom. It would just be nice if, if once in a while the unintended consequences made things easier and more affordable to repair. Yeah, I, I think I think what we're circling around here is this is not the worst thing Apple could do. And I don't think it helps your cause to make it sound like it is. But at the same time, it not being the worst thing Apple could do should not be an excuse to let Apple off the hook for it. Uh, so, you know, try to strike a, a, a balance there. And I think I fix it does a very good job of striking a balance in its post about this to say like, hey, they did this, they did that, this isn't so bad, this is pretty bad, this is the state of it, you should know about it, let's be right. transparent. Um, and 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 so, yeah, I, I think, I hope that Apple can do a firmware update and will do a firmware update uh, to make this easier for uh, personal repair, if nothing else, yeah. to be done, right? You shouldn't have to acquire Please. micro soldering uh, <laughs> to be able to fix the screen yourself. Why not? It's a career skill. They just want to they just want to provide a path for people to, I'm just going to stop right now. I'm looking <laughs> at your face. <laughs> All right. Uh, we talked earlier this week about TikTok, Snap, and others becoming super apps, apps that let you do everything, you know, like make payments at a physical store, buy movie tickets, message your friends, do some shopping. The usual example of this is Tencent's WeChat in China. That's the example we used when we talked about it before. But fintech companies are also developing super apps. So instead of messaging apps that branch out and become super apps, these are payment apps that branch out and become super apps. <laughs> uh, the quintessential example of that is India's Paytm. You may have heard us talk about them before. Uh, there's also Revolut in the UK, New Bank, N-U-B-A-N-K in Latin America, Alipay in China. Uh, in the U.S., the super app hopefuls include SoFi, Chime, and, of course, PayPal, uh, among others. These kinds of apps are finding good early success. Brazil's new bank, for instance, is seeking a $50 billion valuation in its forthcoming IPO, uh, which would make it more valuable than Lloyd's Banking Group or even BBVA. Uh, so, d you know, this isn't DeFi. Uh, this is this is fintech, but uh, it is, <laughs> it's definitely the convergence of we want to be the app on your home screen that you go to most often. And it, whether that started as messaging or started as payments, uh, there's there's a lot of people trying to become that. And a lot of people are investing in that. I mean, I think New Bank, um, Berkshire Hathaway did a major investment in that in their last uh, round okay. when they were valued at a mere $30 billion. <laughs> yeah, gosh, they <laughs> always get in early, those 
Clever Berkshire Hathaway folks. All right, real quickly, Carl Streethern, research fellow in computing at Edinburgh Napier University, writing for The Conversation, and then republished where I saw it on the next web, describes the need for robotic eyes to appear more human, specifically pupil dilation, which you probably don't think about much, but that is a signal of emotion and understanding that the pupils dilate and constrict. Uh, fixed robot eyes have that glassy stare in part because their pupils aren't moving. Strathern was inspired by meeting John Coppinger, one of the engineers who worked on Jabba the Hutt's dilating eyes for Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Uh, it turns out that <laughs> Jabba had very big eyes, so it was a lot easier to make that work in very big eyes. Uh, it's a little harder to make that work at human scale, but Strathern made a silicon membrane coated with graphene to act as the muscle in a Whoa. robot's eye. The graphene could be thin enough to let light pass through, and the membrane would then expand and contract the pupil in response to a field of static electricity. A microprocessor was used to control the reactions and responses both to light, which you just need a sensor for, and emotional cues. So they had a machine learning algorithm trained to recognize facial expressions for happiness and sadness, and then programmed the pupil to dilate appropriately. I feel like we've made not one but two steps closer to Skynet and the Terminator because we've got more realistic pupils, which makes for more realistic eyes and social cooperation. So robots working together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Can we collaborate them before they collaborate us? <laughs> All depends on Cyberdyne systems, sir. Yeah. And and when you think of the Uncanny Valley, this is one thing that I don't hear discussed as much is the, the sure. pupil dilation because – we definitely respond to it, but we don't think about it. You don't think about, oh, that guy's pupils really dilated, <laughs> right? It's just a subconscious response. But when it's well, not it's, there, you interpret the face as being weird somehow. Well, is if on one hand, yes, I agree. On the other hand, if you have a, let's say, a family member or a coworker that maybe has some substance abuse issues, then you're definitely overtly reacting to the gigantic dilated some of, pupils Some of us may be more properly. attuned to it in certain people than others. <laughs> it's a fair point. Definitely a fair point. Uh, another fair point comes from James C. Smith in our mailbag, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, uh, said the chip shortage is affecting many things, including cars. Every time chips are mentioned in the context of cars on DTNS, Tom calls them out as display chips. Is it really the display chips that are a problem for car manufacturers? Or is it the dozens of other chips in airbags, anti-lock brakes, engines, and more? Uh, in other automotive news sources, I don't see people focused on display chips the way DTNS does. Every time you mention display chips, which is very often, it makes me wonder which chips are truly the problem. Uh, well, James, you're right. It's all of them. Uh, I use display chips as an example of the microcontrollers that are a big problem for cars. And the display chips are, are are one of the more frequent ones. They're one of the ones that sideline trucks uh, for Chevy and Ford. Uh, but they're all examples of microcontrollers that are really old. They're on, you know, we're not talking about 10 nanometers here. We're talking about 14 or larger nanometer processes, which means they're on fabrication processes that nobody wants to invest to build new ones for because mm -hmm. chips are just getting smaller. Uh, but yes, it's not just display chips. I use display chips because I think that's the easiest one uh, for people to wrap their heads around. But I'll stop doing that uh, all the time. It's it's crazy, right? Because uh, one of the shortages that a friend of mine is dealing with is uh, USB controllers, which are on a 44 micron processor. Oh, wow. There's literally two or three dozen fabs that can do that around the world. But there's just so much demand right now. But uh, I think it was the Detroit News, one of the local papers, did a whole thing on the chip shortage. And they talked about a typical automobile right now or truck having somewhere between 500 and 1,500 chips inside of it, which yeah. I thought was a little high. But uh, even if it was just 50 or 75 or 100, that's just a lot of silicon to source right yeah. now. There's a, and that's going to contribute to it. James James is absolutely right when he points that out. Uh, though yeah. it is the older and kind of dumber microcontrollers <laughs> that are more often the problem. Yeah. Uh, because like you say, there's fewer fabs. You know, people don't want to keep fabs going for, for stuff that old, right? And so you only have a few, uh, from what I read anyway, you only have a few clients yeah. in auto manufacturers that need these kinds of uh, chips that often. It didn't also help that one of the largest providers of automotive specific, like they're responsible for something like 30% of the world's automotive microprocessors had uh, some incidents at a factory 
uh, when I say incidents, I believe I mean fire. You mean burning uh, down? Yeah. <laughs> burning down. There's been a lot of burning. Down. We've lost AKM. Right. We've lost. There's been a lot of fires. Well, that's that's the... why it's so hard to to for people like, why is there a chip shortage? Like, well, <laughs> there's the toilet paper thing that happened with everybody right. believing there wasn't going to be any need for chips. And then suddenly everybody needed chips. And so then everybody started stockpiling chips, which made the problem worse. Then there's the weather uh, that that messed with plants' ability to get power in Texas and 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 some rain in other places and a lack China. of rain and then there's the fires, uh, then there's the shipping containers all piling up in one part of the world yeah. when they're needed in other parts of the world. So, yeah, it's a it's a whole bunch of different stuff. Turns out when you turn the world off for a few months and then try to turn it back on, it shakes things up a little. You have to turn it back on in the right order. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not as good as it is for your computer to turn it off and turn it on again. Uh, real uh, quickly, a big thanks to our brand new boss, Greg H., who just started Yay! backing us on Patreon. Greg got all the love to himself today. Uh, thank you, Greg, uh, for, for backing us on Patreon. Could be you tomorrow. If you're listening out there, you can get a holiday card mailed to you. Get all kinds of other perks. Patreon.com slash DTNS. Thank you, Patrick Norton. Uh, a pleasure talking tech with you again, my friend. What do you got going on to tell folks about if they want to hear more? Oh, my goodness. Uh, Robert Heron and I are recording the next episode of AVXL this afternoon after this show later on today. And uh, I would like to point out that it has been very cold here in St. Louis. And I've been getting to wear sweaters that I haven't worn in forever. This is delightful. <laughs> I'm glad you'll I, I hope you keep enjoying the cold weather in St. Louis. Uh, folks, we are live Monday through Friday, 4 30 p.m. Eastern 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Rich Strapolino and uh, Sarah Lane doing well. And uh, we're hoping to Yay. Back soon. So keep those good vibes coming. I'll talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Associate producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Pompos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, BioCow, Captain Kipfer, Jack Shid, Steve Guadarrama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, Creative Ast Arts, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Trace Gaynor. Patreon support from Stefan Brown. Contributors for this week's show included Scott Johnson, Justin Robert Young, and Patrick Norton. And guests on this week's show were Tim Stevens, Nate Langson, and Sean Hollister. Thanks to all the patrons, too, who make this show possible.